Thank you all for joining us today. This is the first session of Using UN Biodiversity Lab to Support National Conservation and Sustainable Development Priorities. My name is Amber McCullum, and I will be your presenter alongside some great guest speakers from the United Nations Development Program and some of the member countries. Throughout this series, and for the various languages, we will have different speakers. Today, we will be joined by Annie Veering and Christina Supples. For this training, we will have three one and a half hour sessions on March 24th, March 31st, and on April 7th. We will be presenting the same content in three different live sessions. We will be presenting sessions live in English, French, and Spanish, and are really excited as this will be our first time conducting a French training. Note that you only need to attend one session per day. You can find all the course materials on the website listed here. And after each session, we will have a question and answer portion. Feel free to type your questions into the chat box along the way, and we will try to get to as many as possible at the end. We will also post the questions and answers on our website after the training. If we don't get to your question and you don't see it posted to the website, you can also email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez at our email addresses shown at the bottom of the slide. We will have one follow-on homework that will be available on the course website. This will cover content from the lecture as well as from exercises on the UN Biodiversity Lab Mapper, which we will highlight through um, the entirety of this training. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all the answers via Google Forms by the deadline, which is Tuesday, April 21st. The link to the homework will be available during the final session. Um, on April 7th, you will be able to go to the RSET website and click on the link to complete the homework. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars and complete the homework. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of this course. The only course course prerequisite is the fundamentals of remote sensing, which is shown here, or have the equivalent knowledge. Again, you can find all the course materials on the website shown here, and this includes a PDF of the presentation in all three languages, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, which will take you to our YouTube channel, and a link to the Google form for the homework submission. And again, that will be available on April 7th. Here's a general overview of the course. Today, we will focus on an introduction to spatial data and policies for biodiversity. And this will really set the stage for how to use NASA data for these things and provide the global policy context. Next week, we will focus more specifically on the UN Biodiversity Lab and the data sets they have available in their web tool. In the final week, we'll hear from the user community in a series of country-specific case study examples. This week, we'll begin with an overview of NASA Earth observations for biodiversity. Then I will hand it over to our guest speakers, where, where they will discuss the global policies for biodiversity and how the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP, supports these initiatives. Then we will provide some examples of NASA funded projects related to these efforts. At the end of this session, as I mentioned previously, we will have time for um, question and answers. So let's start off with an overview of remote sensing for biodiversity. Remote sensing, or taking images or other measurements of Earth from above, provides a unique perspective on what is happening on the Earth and thus plays a special role in biodiversity and conservation applications. Consistent measurements in space and time provide the information necessary to study changes and trends in ecosystems. 
Remote sensing data are often paired with ground observations for a more holistic picture of ecosystem and species dynamics. These data are also particularly useful in remote regions where um, ground observations may be scarce. So you can see a couple examples of this in the images along the bottom, um, where the images on the left show elephant tracks in Botswana. And then um, the image on the right shows a probability of sandpiper sightings in California, along the, um, particularly along the Pacific Flyway. There are many ecosystem variables that can be measured via remote sensing. And we will discuss some of these products available on the UN Biodiversity Lab. Oftentimes, remote sensing data is used to understand the physical environment and how that environment changes. This can be used to provide indirect estimates of available habitat for a particular species. Much of these data are used as inputs for things like species distribution modeling. And it's now being used in genetic analysis. We covered some of this in our recent webinar on freshwater habitats, where we talked about how genetic analysis is used to understand um, fish populations. Land cover maps are also often used, and multiple maps generated over time can identify changes like fragmentation or degradation. Remote sensing is also useful for vegetation monitoring. Um, with indices like no the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or the NDVI. And this serves as a proxy for suitable habitat. This image here is a map of forest canopy height in the Amazon, which can be generated with radar data. While, while we'll not cover radar data in this um, particular training, we have an upcoming um, training very soon on land cover mapping with synthetic aperture radar or SAR data um, this summer. So keep an eye out for that on the RSET website. Remote sensing is frequently used to generate maps of terrestrial ecosystems, which are often based on a map that delineates different vegetation types or land uses, such as the one shown here. These types of maps identify discrete categories of land cover. They can be generated using a variety of classification schemes and are improved with local ground data and knowledge. There are also limitations to these maps and it's important to consider accuracy assessments when creating them. Again, we have previous RSET trainings on land cover mapping and accuracy assessment that can be found on our website. Remote sensing can also be used to understand ecosystem function which essentially is the measurement of energy dynamics within an ecosystem. These types of variables include things like net primary productivity, or NPP, evapotranspiration, albedo, or temperature. And finally, as mentioned previously, ecosystem change is particularly important for conservation and biodiversity research and applications. The evaluation of changes from forest to non-forest is one of the most common change metrics. And you can see an animation of this um, here from Brazil. Other landscape changes such as burned area from wildfires, agricultural activities, and urban growth are important variables that can be monitored via remote sensing. While there are many benefits to the use of remote sensing for biodiversity, it's always really important to consider these limitations. Um, be aware of them when you are um, conducting your own research or making decisions about um, the ecosystem based on Earth observations. So these benefits and limitations can vary depending on the sensor being used, the region you're studying, and the questions you're asking. The primary challenge I see is the trade-off between temporal and spatial resolution. Oftentimes, the sensors that monitor a region more frequently have coarse resolution, and the higher spatial resolution sensors take a longer time to um, come back around to the same place on Earth. There are also large amounts of data with unfamiliar file types. However, I believe the barrier to these data is being lowered 
with the proliferation of online user-friendly user -friendly tools um, like the one that we're highlighting in this training. So I see that um, issue as um, not being a real um, barrier in a lot of cases anymore. And finally, there are many more commercial satellite products available. Um, and these commercial products can alleviate some of the issue of the trade-off between temporal, spatial, spectral resolution, but they often um, can be costly and not largely available globally. So let's briefly discuss some of the satellites and sensors that can be used to monitor um, biodiversity and conservation. Please note that this is not an extensive list, but a highlight of those most commonly used, particularly those from NASA. Landsat is probably the most popular satellite, and I'm sure many of you have heard about it before. Um, Landsat was first launched in the early 70s, and most recently Landsat 8 um, was launched in February of 2013. So we have this continuous data at a fairly high resolution, 30 meters generally, which is very useful for examining land surface change over time. All of these data are also freely available by the USGS, and Landsat is a passive sensor that provides optical imagery of the globe every 16 days. And with two Landsats currently in orbit, it is possible to obtain an image every eight days. Um, so this is what we um, call the revisit time of, of Landsat. And there are some differences between the bands of the various Landsats, which can be shown, um, it's articulated in this image at the bottom of the slide, uh, so this is something to really be aware of when using uh, Landsat data from different time periods. Landsat is really one of the most prolific satellites for monitoring our Earth's ecosystems. Here is a visualization showing one location of the area in western Tanzania where the Jane Goodall Institute is working. After focusing on the region to the southeast of Gombe National Park, this visualization shows change in forest cover between 1972 and 1999. Forested areas are, are shown in shades of green and non-forested regions are shown in shades of brown. So this is just one example of what can be done um, using these kind of remote sensing imagery. As mentioned previously, there are pros and cons that need to be considered when using Landsat. So I mentioned we have this nice long history of data at a resolution that um, is high enough to study um, ecosystem changes. However, um, this, the repeat time or the revisit time of the sensor is about every 16 days. So Landsat is not particularly useful for monitoring things like active fires or floods. Here's another example of how Landsat is used for conservation and biodiversity where the animation shown here um, identifies disturbances that have affected the forests that spotted owls consider to be suitable habitat for nesting. And this um, is an area in eastern Washington. MODIS is another key sensor, and it was really designed to measure large scale global dynamics across land, oceans, and the atmosphere. MODIS flies on two satellites um, in order to capture imagery of the same area on Earth at different times of day. The two instruments, Aqua and Terra, are almost identical to each other and both generate this daily, continuous, global, multispectral, and multitemporal data of the Earth to build a comprehensive record of um, some large scale parameters on Earth. The spatial resolution depends on the product you're using, but it varies from 250 meters to one kilometer. There are 36 bands, including the visible and near infrared, which are really great for mapping vegetation over large areas. Like Landsat, the details of the sensor and the subsequent imagery and products should be considered. The greatest benefit of MODIS is the daily imagery. While MODIS data are only available back to 2000, 
similar measurements will continue with a new sensor, new-ish, um, called VIRS, that I'll discuss in a moment. The greatest downside of MODIS is the coarser spatial resolution, which can make it difficult for mapping smaller scale landscape dynamics. Um, however, MODIS is really useful for monitoring things like fire, which you can see some of the recent fire activity in California um, in 2018 here. The Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or VIRS, is similar to MODIS with a few extra and updated aspects. These data are available from 2012 to present with a slightly improved spatial resolution for one of the channels at 375 meters, and there are also 750 meter products available. VIRS data can be used for similar mapping of vegetation changes and thermal anomalies. So like MODIS, it's really useful for mapping fires. VIRS data have also been extensively used for monitoring um, night lights, um, which have been used for population mapping around the globe. Um, it's also been used during disasters when um, the lights go out. So it's, a, it's really useful for these large scale events. One recent example of VIRS data um, comes from the fires burning in Australia. So the animation you can see here on the left shows smoke plumes coming off of Eastern Australia and traveling across the globe. And those smoke plumes are shown um, in yellow using an aerosol index. The image on the right indicates actively burning fires um, with all of the red locations from November 1st to December 5th of um, 2019. A couple other sensors that are used for biodiversity are the Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer, or ASTER. ASTER is on board the Terra satellite, um, so the same one that MODIS is on board, one of the MODIS sen uh, sensors but it provides higher spatial resolution data um, of 15 meters for the visible spectrum. The downside of ASTER though, is that the images are tasked, which means that there are not consistent measurements over the same locations over time. But it can be really useful for things like vegetation health, land change, wildfires, and flooding. I have included this great over overview webinar that was produced by the Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or LPDAC, which is the portal that holds the ASTER data. So you can um, go there and watch this webinar to get more detailed information about ASTER. Another um, data set is the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, or SRTM. And um, this provides elevation data. Um, it was flown on board the Endeavor in 2000. So you can obtain elevation data at 90 meters and 30 meters. And this is really useful because it can be combined with other things like optical imagery to identify eco-region analyses, especially as they pertain to changes in elevation. The European Space Agency has, also has a suite of satellites that can be used for biodiversity. So I've outlined two here, Sentinel-2 and the Spot constellation. Sentinel-2 is similar to Landsat with an improved spatial resolution of 10 to 20 meters for the visible and near infrared. It also has a shorter revisit time of about five days. There's been, recently there's been a lot of work being done on harmonizing Landsat and Sentinel-2 data. Um, and you can get more information about that um, at this link here as well. And this is really fantastic because with these similar um, spatial resolution and some similar um, spectral resolution, we could be able to view and identify changes in things like vegetation um, over shorter time periods um, with the revisit of Landsat and Sentinel combined. Um, and this image here on the right shows a, a Sentinel-2 image of um, forests that have been converted into farmland from Brazil. Um, there are also many spot satellites, and these were created by the French Space Agency. And they are most common, the ones that are most commonly used are um, versions six and seven. 
spot data have visible and near infrared bands and have higher spatial resolution of six meters with a fairly frequent re revisit time. And as I mentioned, there are, are many other satellites and sensors that have been used for conservation and biodiversity, um, particularly those um, from the commercial sector um, that we're, we're not really discussing in this training. But it, at least this gives you a good overview of some of the most commonly used data and products. And as I mentioned, we will dive into the products available on the UN Biodiversity Lab in session two. Um, but up next, we will bring it back to set the stage for the framework of global biodiversity initiatives and how the UNDP and specifically NASA funded projects align with these large scale efforts. So now I'd like to hand it over to our guest speakers today, Christina Supples, Senior Technical Advisor, and Anna Verning, Technical Capacity Building Specialist and UN Biodiversity Lab Coordinator. And they both work with the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP. So over to you. Great, thank you so much, Amber. It's a pleasure to be here today. Amber has provided us with some great background on NASA's work on remote sensing and how these data can be used to support biodiversity conservation planning and monitoring. During the remainder of today's webinar, my colleague Annie and I will provide an overview of UNDP's work with partners on spatial data. We will introduce you to some of the key international policies on biodiversity and climate change, as well as provide an overview of the work that our team executes through the UN Biodiversity Lab. As a reminder, you can see the outline of the webinar presentation here. Now I'll start by providing an overview of UNDP's work to build spatial data capacity around the globe, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague Annie to provide more information about the UN Biodiversity Lab and our NASA-supported projects. Let's get started by setting the context. We've heard about the wide range of environmental monitoring that NASA can support through their satellites and sensors. But let me step back a minute and ask you, why is this work important? The answer is a picture that has a lot of bad news. First, we must urgently take action to safeguard nature and address the climate crisis. No matter where we look, we're witnessing a rapid unraveling of our planet Earth. In 2018, the landmark report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change showed that we have just 12 years, and now we're down to 10 because it's 2020, to take action to mitigate the catastrophic impacts of climate change. Last year, an equivalent report on biodiversity from the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services shared that we're also seeing unprecedented declines of nature and over a million species, plants and animals, are at risk of extinction. These twin threats to the survival of life on Earth are increasingly recognized as deeply interconnected. For example, unsustainable land use accounts for over a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions. So as we look at these intertwined essential challenges of our times, what do we do? What can we do? At the global level, international policy frameworks can support countries to take action on nature and climate. These international agreements, many with near universal ratification, set global standards for national policies and actions and help build political will. I'd like to talk to you about four of these agreements today. First, the United Nations 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development, adopted in 2015 by the UN member states, include 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Their purpose is to ensure human well-being and planetary health with no one left behind. The SDGs consider social, economic, and environmental sustainability as indivisible. Second, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, with 196 parties, outlines global priorities for the conservation and sustainable use of nature. The third agreement, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, with 197 parties, as well as its landmark 2015 Paris Agreement, set global targets for mitigating and adapting to climate change. 
And finally, the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, which is considered the third and final of the so-called Rio Conventions, is the sole legally binding international agreement that links the environment and development to sustainable land management. These four political mandates directly influence UNDP's work in response to the biodiversity and climate crises. Let's spend a few minutes exploring the synergies across these agreements. So governments translate these international agreements into national action by identifying targets and developing related policy documents. For sustainable development, each country's national development plan charts actions towards achievement of the SDGs. Under the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, governments develop policies called National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans, or NBSAPs, that guide them on how to take action to achieve national targets. Countries also develop nationally determined contributions as a part of their pledges to support the Paris Agreement. Red Plus strategies also help governments reduce emissions by protecting forests and can contribute to these NDCs. Last, under the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, parties have also set their own land degradation neutrality targets. Taken together, these commitments and plans can provide a strong framework from which to take action. However, this is a complex and challenging body of work. Often we see that action under each of these agreements is siloed across different ministries or even different branches of the same ministry. We see the same trend in action taken by international organizations, NGOs, and civil society. So how can we bring all of this work together? Let's start by exploring an example of how governments are working together to take action for climate, nature, and people in tropical forests. So tropical forest loss accounts for more than 90% of global deforestation. This amount is equivalent to the total greenhouse gas emissions released by the European Union. Investments to stop deforestation in tropical countries comprise less than 1.5% of the $256 billion committed to climate change mitigation by institutions and developed country donors since 2010. So by simply shifting financial investments to support more actions to protect tropical forests, we come up with effective nature-based solutions to address the climate crisis. What are nature-based solutions? In short, nature-based solutions are actions that we take to protect, restore, and sustainably use forests, grasslands, wetlands, and other parts of nature. Nature-based solutions not only address the biodiversity crisis, but they also contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation. They help us combat desertification and land degradation, and enhance food and water security. Nature-based solutions are emphasized as critical by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They're often already included in national biodiversity or Red Plus plans across the types of policies we discussed previously. And nature-based solutions also help us to link the international and national commitments I showed you. And even better, they're often already promoted by indigenous peoples and local communities. Let's look at another example. If we want to succeed in holding global warming below two degrees Celsius, the current nationally determined contributions or NDCs emissions reductions need to be tripled. Holding warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius would require existing commitments to be increased around five fold. Yet again, nature-based action is powerful. And by investing in action to protect, restore, and sustainably manage nature alone, we can achieve one third of the climate change mitigation solutions that are needed to help us get to this goal. But to overcome these challenges, we also need to know where to act. This is where spatial data come in and the data provided by the diverse array of satellites and sensors that Amber introduced earlier. 
Spatial data help us to identify where and how to take effective action that delivers across the key issues of our time. Spatial data can also play a powerful role in monitoring progress towards the ambitious international targets set out by the Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, as well as the Nature-Based Sustainable Development Goals. However, through UNDP and UN Environment's work to support 140 countries to fulfill their commitments to the Convention on Biological Diversity, we've come to recognize that policymakers' capacity to access and use planetary data is highly variable. A recent analysis we conducted showed that a shockingly low number of countries use spatial data in their planning and reports for biodiversity in nature. Imagine that I'm a policymaker looking at my country's national biodiversity plan to figure out where I can take action. On average, I'm gonna find four maps and one of those are gonna be of the country's political boundaries. If I turn to a recent national report on the state of nature in my country, I'm gonna find maybe five spatial analyses and many of those are the same ones that are included in the national plan. I'm not likely to find any maps or data that can guide me on where to implement new protection, conservation, or restoration work. And I'm also probably not gonna find any information on ecosystem services, even though we know they provide a critical link between nature, climate, and sustainable development. Therefore, we feel that we have a great opportunity to build capacity for policymakers to use spatial data to guide development of related nature-based policies and really have an impact. Since 2017, UNDP and our partners have worked to address this gap. Our team within UNDP, the Global Program on Nature for Development, supports action at the nexus of nature, climate, and sustainable development. We implement eight key projects that span the local to global level. And today we wanna to focus on our National Biodiversity Support Project and our work with the UN Biodiversity Lab. So first, our national biodiversity support work. In this project, we provide governments with technical support to more effectively achieve their commitments to the Convention on Biological Diversity, one of the international policy agreements that I introduced earlier. We work very closely with UN Environment and the CBD Secretariat to help over 140 countries plan implement, monitor, and report on their progress to achieve this convention. As part of this effort, we're building the capacity of governments and policymakers to use spatial data for their decision-making purposes. While technology is revolutionizing our ability to map nature, there's still a gap in how countries are integrating the resulting information into their biodiversity and nature planning, monitoring, and reporting efforts. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Annie to talk more about this work. Great, thanks so much, Chrissy. It's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks so much to all of you who are joining us from around the world. So now that Chrissy's laid out some of the context that surrounds our work, as well as the goals of our broader Nature for Development program, I'll dive specifically into our work around spatial data and spatial planning. So I'll talk a little bit about our UN Biodiversity Lab platform, and I'll also touch on our NASA funded projects. So let me get started with UN Biodiversity Lab. We launched UN Biodiversity Lab in July, 2018, in partnership with UN Environment and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, as well as with key funding from the Global Environment Facility. We also rely on the support of several key technical partners, including NASA, UN and World Conservation Monitoring Center, Grid Geneva, and MAPEX. So what is UN Biodiversity Lab? The UN Biodiversity Lab is a free open source platform that provides policymakers in 137 countries with access to the best spatial data and analytic tools, regardless of their GIS experience. We first created the platform to support countries in their commitment to the Convention on Biological Diversity, and specifically 
the development of their six national reports, as Chrissy introduced earlier. And when we launched the platform, we launched it with a challenge. We asked countries to double the number of maps between their fifth national report and their sixth national report. And to support them to do this, we provided a range of support systems available through the platform to enable governments to access and utilize spatial data and maps. I'll run through some of these key features today just at a very high level, and during our training next week, we'll dive into the details of how to actually access and conduct these different analyses. So first, UN Biodiversity Lab provides access to over 100 of the world's best global data layers on biodiversity, protected areas, and sustainable development. Anyone can access these data through the public side of the site. Second, the platform provides priority access and the ability to visualize all data that are created through our two NASA-funded projects. I'll give you a little bit more details about these projects later in my presentation today. So third, and this is where it gets really interesting to us, working with countries on their six national reports, we created private national projects that serve as workspaces for each country we support. These national projects provide a space to upload national data and visualize it in combination with our global data set. Fourth, the platform offers the ability to conduct basic analyses all without any prior GIS experience. And finally, countries can use the platform to create what we call story maps, which are dynamic photo essays that incorporate maps and text to communicate conservation success. So who uses UN Biodiversity Lab? Through our work to support countries around their commitments to the Convention on Biological Diversity, we have over 200 policy relevant users from 60 countries who are active on the platform. UN Biodiversity Lab also serves as the official decision support system for our two NASA funded projects. And finally, anyone can access UN Biodiversity Lab and take advantage of the resources available. Since the platform was launched, we've had over 23,000 views of the public site. As we move forward, our goal is to build on our policy relevant user base to support other key actors to take action for nature, climate, and sustainable development. The so UN Biodiversity Lab is one of many platforms out there that are providing spatial data to users. You may be familiar with Resource Watch, Global Forest Watch, World Environmental Situation Room, Earth Pulse, uh, or many others who are working to increase access to spatial data as a valuable social good. We see three key areas that set us apart from other spatial data platforms. First, through our work with the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, we have ensured that spatial data has been included in decisions around the reporting process, leading to a broad political mandate for this work. Second, direct outreach to countries supported by UNDP and UN Environment around the six national report process means that we have a key network in place to engage users. Finally, our private national projects provide space for countries to upload their national data and use these when better than global data. Time and again, we've heard that this is essential for action at the national level. We believe that working from this niche provides a powerful way to understand how we can support governments and make connections to other key user groups. Now, before I wrap up, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the two NASA-supported projects that UNDP participates in. Both our NASA projects work to support the translation of leading scientific research into action for conservation planning, monitoring, and reporting. 
These projects bring together top tier researchers from five different universities, UNDP, and the governments of eight pilot countries. The first project that brought this team together was the Forest Integrity Project, which began in 2017 and runs through this year. Last year, we received funding for a second closely related project, the Life on Land Project. So together, these projects work to provide key data on forests that can support planning and action on many of those key international policy agreements that Chrissy introduced earlier. In particular, for those of you who are familiar, these data are designed to support conservation planning and reporting on IHG Biodiversity Targets 5 and 11 of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and they can also support Sustainable Development Goal 15, which focuses on life on land. They also provide key data that can support action across all of the conventions we mentioned earlier by monitoring change in forest condition over time, identifying last of the wilds forest ecosystems, and showing key areas for connectivity. Together, these data can help countries focus restoration and protection efforts across their different international commitments. So let me start by just giving you a quick overview of the work through the Forest Integrity Project. From 2017 through 2020, we've worked with eight pilot countries to shape and advance this work. These countries are shown on in dark green on the map you can see on this slide and include Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ecuador, Indonesia, Peru, and Vietnam. In 2019, we shared project data with UNDP and government and an additional 21 countries who have humid tropical forests. Those countries are shown in light green on this slide here. This project has three key objectives. First, to develop high quality data on forest condition, human pressure, forest integrity, and forest connectivity. Second, to show how these data can be applied to support conservation decision making. And third, to make this data available free of cost through the UN Biodiversity Lab. The Forest Integrity Project is producing six key data sets, which you can see on this screen, and we'll explore in more depth in our webinar next week. All right, on to the Life on Land Project. So this project kicked off last year and builds on the data that we're, we've created and are continuing to create through the Forest Integrity Project. However, it focuses in on three particular countries, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. This project has four goals. The first is to work closely with these countries to determine how research from the science team can support them to implement and report on Sustainable Development Goal 15. Second, Based on input from these countries, the science team will conduct analyses to show how land use change and climate change will impact forest structure, vertebrate habitats of key species, and water risk over the next 80 years. Third, we'll work with countries to apply these data to inform implementation and reporting around SDG 15. We'll also work with them to see how this data can support their commitments to other international environmental agreements. Fourth, we'll share this data through UN Biodiversity Lab and work with countries to refine the platform as possible based on their needs. This project will generate five different types of data, all of which you can see here, and all of which are relevant for Sustainable Development Goal 15. I'm happy to go into more detail about these data or the data produced by the Forest Integrity Project during our Q&A session. What I really wanted to do here was provide an overview of both these NASA projects 
which bring together all of the different elements we've discussed today. These projects begin with raw data from NASA's satellites and sensors. They draw on the best scientific minds to create data layers that support action to implement and monitor on key international policy agreements. They become broadly accessible through UN Biodiversity Lab. And at UNDP, we work with countries to build capacity to use these types of data and to understand how they can support their national priorities. These NASA projects are just one part of our work with UN Biodiversity Lab, but they represent our commitment to connect science and policy to support action in diverse national contexts. So in closing, let me share just a few final thoughts. As Chrissy framed for us, we have 10 years to avoid the catastrophic impacts of climate change. We also only have 10 years left to achieve the ambitious sustainable development goals. Across sectors, our norms are shifting and we're hearing increasing calls for transformative change. At UNDP, we see, ne we see action at the nature climate nexus as a key way to take action. And through our work with UN Biodiversity Lab, we hope to support policymakers and other key stakeholders to use spatial data as a powerful tool to catalyze this transformative change. So with this, I will say thank you and hand it back over to you, Amber. Thank you, Christina and Annie, for that great presentation. I really loved how it set the stage for um, the usefulness of the UN Biodiversity Tool, and I loved the NASA-funded projects that you highlighted as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, and just as a reminder, I wanted to thank you all for being here with us today. And we will have some time for questions. But um, just in case we don't address your questions, uh, you can email myself or my colleague, Juan Torres Perez. Again, our email address is listed here. Um, if you have general questions about RSET, you can contact our program manager, Anna Prados. And again, we've mentioned it many times, but you can always visit the RSET website to um, get the information about this training, but also to find other trainings. We have a lot of um, trainings in different application areas like um, water resources and health and air quality that may be of interest to you as well. Please join us next week at the same time for our second session. And during this session, we're going to explore the UN Biodiversity Lab um, mapper and um, get a demonstration of how that works. Okay, um, now we're moving on to the question and answer session. Um, so just give us a moment while we pull up the um, question and answer documents uh, and move over to that portion of the uh, webinar. Uh, we've already started to see some of your questions come through, so thank you all for that. Um, I also want to mention that we have um, right now, 785 participants from around the world online, um, and it's such a, a great community we have here. So do feel free to share your name, your organization, your contact information into the Q&A as well, and we'll um, allow everyone to see that if you want to connect with each other. Um, we're really grateful to have such a broad global audience on with us today. Um, so I'm going to get started. Uh, I'm Amber. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't recognize the voice, um, I'm going to get started on the first couple of questions and then hand it over to our um, UNDP uh, colleagues to answer some more specific um, biodiversity type questions. Um, so the first question we have here, um, how can I get ecosystem raster data? Um, and we're going to talk a lot about this throughout the training, so stay tuned. Uh, we're going to highlight um, the UN Biodiversity Lab next week, uh, as I mentioned, but I've also listed a few other um, 
NASA data portals where you can um, use these to access a variety of the satellite remote sensing data that we mentioned today. One of my favorite is NASA Worldview. It's this really beautiful display and um, the data are categorized based on theme. So if you're interested in say wildfires, for example, you can click on um, all of the data that are relevant to wildfires there. Um, it's just a really great portal and it's near real time. So for um, things like MODIS and VIRS data, um, they are updated really uh, quickly. So um, that's, that's a great one. Another, um, some of the others are Earth Data Search, uh, Landsat Look Viewer. I've also listed the um, LPDAC website there. Um, then they host a variety of data, but also tools to analyze um, uh, data such as the appears tool, which is great for time series analysis. And we've highlighted that in previous trainings as well. And I've also listed the um, Copernicus Open Access Hub, where you can um, access all the European um, satellite information like Sentinel-2. Um, okay, so for uh, question two, this question asks, will the OCO2 um, satellite, um, so that's the um, carbon observatory satellite, be introduced in this training? And unfortunately, no, we will not cover OCO2, uh, but that's a great suggestion. We've never covered that in a land training uh, before. Uh, we, we love to get feedback on these types of things, uh, give us ideas. Um, but I've also linked the um, RSET air quality webinar, um, website there, and I believe that um, some of the air quality trainings may have covered um, OCO2. Um, so it, it might be worthwhile checking in um, on um, that website to uh, look at the health and air quality trainings that RSET has as well. Okay, so um, Annie and Christina, I'll hand it over to you for question three. Thank you, Amber. So this is Christina. And question three is, <clears throat> excuse me, how will the UN Biodiversity, how is the UN Biodiversity Lab working towards the upcoming post-2020 biodiversity goals? So we're working with parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity to help them identify and learn how to use spatial data to better understand the progress they make in achieving the convention. And in turn, we're also using the same data and tools to help them understand the best post-2020 commitments for their countries and globally, as well as the targets related to them. While recently preparing their six national reports to the CBD, we use the UN Biodiversity Lab to raise awareness about the power of spatial data and help countries collect the kind of information they needed to be able to measure this progress. As many of you know, countries have been meeting since August 2019, if not earlier, to discuss the elements of the CBD's post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And many countries are highlighting the importance of using spatial data for implementation, monitoring, and reporting. And we use the UN Biodiversity Lab to help them undertake these analyses around the world. Because as we mentioned in the presentation, you can use the UN Biodiversity Lab without having previous GIS experience. And it also makes many global and regional data sets available that countries wouldn't otherwise have access to or be able to analyze without you know, significant resources. Once the post-2020 global biodiversity framework is agreed to, UNDP and UN Environment will continue to work with countries to use the UN Biodiversity Lab and related spatial data to revise their upcoming national biodiversity strategy and action plans to make them more spatially explicit and then determine monitoring and reporting methods derived from them that can be continually addressed over time. As these targets begin to emerge, we're working with a scientific advisory team and key partners from UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Center to offer this comprehensive support package. Back over to you, Amber. Okay, great. Um, so I believe question four um, is related to Landsat. 
So I started to answer that question as well. The question asks, which Landsat is best suited to get biodiversity data? Are there any general considerations or guidelines for selecting which Landsat to use for specific biodiversity to map? Um, so we do have this uh, suite of constellation of NASA sat of Landsat satellites um, from the 70s, as I mentioned, um, and so it's this really great way to analyze change over time. Um, so the specific Landsat data that you may be interested in using might just depend on the time period of interest. Um, Landsat 8 was launched in 2013, um, but prior to that, uh, Landsat 7 does have some issues with um, striping in the imagery where you get these little gaps in the data. Um, but Landsat 5 is, has been a real uh, workhorse for us and um, is, is still um, providing some imagery um, but it, that's also a great resource. So for example, if you're interested in mapping forest cover, say from 2001, and identifying how that forest cover has changed in 2018 or present, you would likely use Landsat 5 for the, the first year, 2001, and then Landsat 8 for the second time period. Um, I just wanna, again, state the caveat that you really do wanna be careful when using um, different Landsat data, because while the they're very similar, there are some um, minor differences in the bands um, and the, the wavelength range of those bands. So for example, Landsat 8 has um, ad additional um, coastal aerosol band um, that was not in previous Landsats. So I've also provided um, a couple of links here, um, the first is a timeline of wh which, which Landsat satellite was flying at which times. And then um, there's another resource there from the USGS who um, manages all the data um, about the different Landsat bands and how you can compare Landsats uh, from different time periods there. And um, back over to you all for question five. Amy, why don't you take question five? What data in the UN Biodiversity Lab is applicable to small countries such as Israel, which need high resolution data? Amy, Amy's having some trouble with unmuting, so I'll go ahead and respond. So we worked with many countries on a case-by-case -case basis to address this question. We recognize that often small countries have higher resolution national data, and that's why we've created private workspaces on the UN Biodiversity Lab for all of the countries that we work with. They, you can upload national level data to visualize and an, analyze in combination with the global data that we have. Our spatial data expert, Scott Atkinson, will be joining us next week, can also advise you on what global data layers might be most useful in the small country you live in, depending on its geography. We have at least 100 data sets that are high resolution and we can feature those in projects for you as well. We're working to build connections with key partners such as the BioPama program in the Caribbean. They're developing regional hubs to store higher resolution data. And once we have those relationships established, we can better connect uh, these regional data providers and conveners with other institutions that can offer higher resolution, resolution data for small countries or small island nations as well. Should I move on to question six, Amber? Yeah, that would be great. We're still okay. trying to work on um, getting Annie unmuted, so. Okay. <laughs> Annie, once you're unmuted, feel free to jump in. And until then, oh, I'll just keep it. Works. Oh, there she is. Okay. <laughs> Finally. Annie, was there anything else you wanted to add on the 
working with small countries or small islands and their uh, need for data? No, I just think really highlighting that Biopama and other organizations are working a lot directly with specific countries or with specific regions to make higher resolution data available. Um, so we're really trying to partner up with those organizations that are focused on that and see how we can stream in their data to UN Biodiversity Lab to make it accessible to countries. Um, so really trying to maintain that balance between getting the most high resolution global data that we can to put on the site and then working with countries to upload their national data to their national projects or to connect with regional actors such as these who might have higher resolution data. And also Chrissy mentioned, but really working on a case by case basis with countries um, as, as these questions come up to try to find the best data that is available for them based on their particular needs and focuses. So I think that's that's it for question five, but um, Chrissy, do you want me to cover question six or do you want to take that one back? I'll take that one and then we'll switch back and forth. Great, sounds good. So question six says, does biodiversity loss accompany only land degradation and desertification? And the response is that biodiversity loss is happening all around us for so many reasons, including climate change, invasive species, over harvesting and habitat loss. It's not only tied to the pressure of land aggregation and desertification. So I could tie this into the UN Biodiversity Lab by saying that our goal is to help countries look at a landscape and understand all the pressures using data that are affecting their biodiversity targets or the desired outcomes they have, and then understand how the actions they take can affect um, the conservation, protection, or restoration of biodiversity to make sure that we have the resources we need to sustain our planet over time. Uh, there is a previous arrest webinar on land degradation, which also covers desertification, and we'll share the link to that in the notes. Turning it over to you, Annie, for question seven. Great, thanks, Chrissy. All right, so question seven is, is there a UN Biodiversity Lab in Africa and does Mozambique have access to UN Biodiversity Lab? So the short answer is yes. Uh, UN Biodiversity Lab is available to any country and we have created private national projects for all of the countries that we've worked with through the six national reporting process. So this is nearly 140 countries, including many African countries. So we'll go into this in a little bit more depth next week. Um, but in general, anyone can access the public side of the site and select the country that they're interested in from the pull down menu and then see what data is available for that country. In addition, many of the countries that we've worked with already have private national projects where they may have already uploaded national level data. So we'll provide you with a little bit more information about this next week and show you how to connect to the focal point for your country, who we call the administrator of the country's private workspace. And we're also really open to working with you on a case by case basis if you're interested in creating your own private project for a particular need in your country. Um, we'd love to hear from you and explore what might be possible. So our, our contact information will go out in the presentation and in our follow-up and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Annie. So the next question, um, question eight says, how do you identify I may have, I completely misinterpreted this program. So, or this question, the question says, how do you identify areas in different countries to support and carry out restoration programs? And I interpret it to be, um, how do we identify the countries that we support? So um, I think I'll answer both if that's okay. So we support parties, which are countries that have signed on to the CBD that are eligible to receive funding from the Global Environmental Facility, frequently referred to as the JAF. This includes over 140 developing middle-income and small island nations. 
The Jeff Jesperson History was established on the eve of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit to help tackle our planet's most pressing environmental problems. And it's a, a major funder of work to implement the Convention on Biological Diversity. And you can learn more by visiting their website, thejeff.org. Um, from there, once a country receives funding from the Jeff to do their uh, either planning or reporting work to the CBD, we work with, they, they identify their own priorities of what that might be, and then we support them to identify uh, what, that's so if it's a restoration program that they're interested in, we can work with them to use the principles of systematic conservation planning, GIS tools, work with scientists and capacity support programs to help figure out the direction that they're going in and what actions they would want to take to meet their restoration goals. Is there anything that you'd want to add there, Annie? No, nothing in particular. Thanks. Great. So a related question is question nine that asks, would it be possible to develop interim targets and use remote sensing, sensing to follow up uh, post 2020 and onwards, and the answer is absolutely yes. This would be an excellent application of the platform, and we where we are hoping that all of the countries we work with could be going. So the idea is that you would set or update your national conservation plan and the targets within it, and then as part of that, you would also identify ways that you could use spatial data to monitor and report on progress to achieve those targets on an ongoing basis over time. Okay, over to you for question 10. I think question 10 actually might be a question for Amber. So Amber, back over to you for that one. Yeah, great. Um, I started to answer that a little bit. The question is, can we get any other spatial data to map disturbance factor except fire, pasture, and deforestation? The first thing that came to my mind was mapping urban areas. Um, and fragmentation. So um, you can also find data on urban extent, expansion, um, land settlements on NASA Worldview, um, and you can um, obtain those data from the CDAC, um, which is the Socioeconomic um, Data Center or something along those lines. I added the link to that there um, from Columbia. And um, we also, so those are related more to the socioeconomic uh, factors that play into uh, biodiversity loss. Um, and we also had another webinar focused on this great tool from Conservation International called Trends.Earth. And it's used primarily for land degradation um, as a QGIS plugin. However, they do have a uh, portion focused on urban mapping as well, and they have a great web tool for that as well as a QGIS plugin. And we highlighted that in our um, final session of that training series, and I've included the link there for that as well. Um, and, and that's really what came to mind initially um, beyond fires, uh, deforestation, degradation. Um, but if there's any others you, you all can think of, we can certainly mention those uh, as well. Great, thanks, Amber. So I can jump back in and take question 11. So this question is, how has UN Biodiversity Lab been successful in policy interventions using spatial data? Can anyone upload data on UN Biodiversity Lab? And if so, what is the authenticity of the data? So this is several different questions. I'll tackle the first one on policy interventions first. So to start, we focused UN Biodiversity Lab and supporting countries specifically on their six national reports on the state of biodiversity in their countries. So this is really, tracking their progress against the Convention on Biological Diversity's IEG biodiversity targets, as well as any national targets they have. So through this process, UN Biodiversity Lab has been extremely helpful for the vast majority of the countries that we support, and we'll be focusing on this topic 
in particular during the third and final session of this webinar series on April 7th. So a lot of what we're seeing is that there's been an increase in the use of this data for reporting. And as we move into the next cycle around the Convention on Biological Diversity, that's when countries will be updating their national biodiversity plans and starting to design policy interventions based on those updated plans. So we're planning to build on the base that we've created over the past two years working with countries to transition into this revision and implementation phase, um, supporting countries to use spatial data to really help them meet national priorities. Uh, in our third webinar on April 7th, we'll also have representatives from Costa Rica and Colombia who will talk in a lot more depth about specifically how they're using spatial data and UN Biodiversity Lab to support their monitoring and reporting on biodiversity. Um, as, as one example for now, a lot of the countries we work with are using UN Biodiversity Lab to help them monitor and I identify new locations for protected areas. Uh, they're also using it to track changes in illegal trade and wildlife uh, and a variety of other uh, monitoring and reporting aspects. Um, let's see. So let me move on to the second part of this question, which is, can anyone upload data on UN Biodiversity Lab? Yes and no. So first of all, on the, our team at UNDP, UN Environment, and with our other partners controls the data that's available on the public side of the site. So we love to get recommendations on data that should be included on the public side of the site, but that's an, a decision that's made by our scientific advisory team based on the validity and authenticity of the data. Within the private national projects for each country, this space is controlled by an administrator that's been designated by our focal point in country. So this administrator controls what data is uploaded in the private national project and has full discretion there. So when we're talking about the, the public side of the site, that's our team who's reviewing suggestions and determining what is uploaded in the end. For the national level projects, the countries have full control over this. Chrissy, anything to add on that one? No, that was great, thank you. Great, uh, so I think I can take question 12 as well. And this one was specifically on the NASA Forest Integrity Project and asked why were many of the West Africa countries excluded from the project? So this is a great question, thanks. Uh, the project was looking at countries who specifically have a humid tropical forest biome. So that we initially focused on eight geographically diverse countries that had this particular biome. And in the final year of the project, we've made the project data available to all countries who have this particular tropical forest biome. So if you don't see your country included on the map we showed, it's simply because you don't have this very particular forest biome that the project was focused on. Um, so any of the 21 countries that are part of that scale up have this particular biome and so the data is applicable to their countries. All right, Amber, I think back over to you for question 13. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, the question is, can students from developing countries have access to capacity building trainings on GIS and remote sensing? And the answer is yes. All of the RSET webinars are uh, freely available online, so you can access the presentation, um, all of the exercises that we have for some of the more advanced trainings, as well as view the recordings from all of the, the sessions. We have an RSET YouTube channel now um, where you can just, anyone can go on and, and watch those. Um, and I do highly recommend some of the more advanced trainings as we have example exercises, um, sort of more like a GIS lab that you would see in a, in a classroom setting um, where we step through of these processes and we try to use open source tools such as QGIS 
um, as those are freely available, um, as well as uh, we have um, a training where we used R um, to conduct some analysis. And we really like to highlight these web tools that are online and freely available. So um, do take a look at the RSET website and um, you can scroll through the list of all of our trainings there. Thank you. Great, thanks, Amber. So I can take question 14, which asks, could you kindly elaborate further on Grid Geneva and MapX? Yeah, so UN Biodiversity Lab was created by three convening partners, UNDP, UN Environment, and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity with funding from the Global Environment Facility. The back end of the site is powered by MapX, which is uh, basically manages all of our data and the analytic tools that are available through UN Biodiversity Lab. MapX is run by Grid Geneva, which is a UN Environment University of Geneva partnership. Uh, so they're responsible for the back end maintenance of the site uh, and the development of new features. So we've worked closely with them to make the platform what it is today, and they're one of our key technical partners on the site. So for question 15, I think I will hand that back over to Chrissy. Great. So question 15 asks how countries are picked for integration into the UN Biodiversity Lab projects and what are the criteria? As I previously mentioned, the UN Biodiversity Lab was created with generous support from the GEF to support eligible countries to develop data-driven, spatially accurate reports on their progress to achieve the CBD at a national level. So countries that qualified for that, of which there were over 140 developing small island and middle-income nations, received project spaces. We're currently in the process of exploring other use cases with different donors and hope that there would be additional capacity in the future. So if you'd like to learn more, you're interested in using the UN Biodiversity Lab for your own purposes, please don't hesitate to be in touch. And Annie Verning can explain how the UN Biodiversity Lab can support you further. Question 16, I'll just go ahead and take, and then I'll uh, switch it over to you, Annie, for 17. So the next question is, can you download the map layers from the UN Biodiversity Lab if you want to overlay them with your own spatial data? The answer to that question is yes, absolutely. And that's going to be the focus of our webinar next week. So please come back and learn more then. Over to you, Annie. Great, thanks, Chrissy. All right, so question 17 is what is the procedure to get access to UN Biodiversity Lab data? So this will also cover in detail next week. So as Chrissy said, please come back and learn more. Um, but basically this is pretty simple. If you access, if you go to www.unbiodiversitylab.org, you can access any of the data layers without even registering on the site, or you can create a profile that enables you to access a few additional functionalities and visualize the data, create maps, and run basic analyses. So we'll, we'll run through how to register, how to log in, and how to use UN Biodiversity Lab, including searching through the data, visualizing data, creating maps, and running basic analyses next week. So we encourage you to come back and learn more with us then. All right, uh, Chrissy, I will hand it back to you for question 19. Okay, question 19 is similar. Um, how are countries picked to integrate into the projects? What are the criteria um, uh, specifically looking at Guyana? And so we touched on this earlier, Guyana is an example of a Jeff supported country and therefore they have a private workspace on the UN Biodiversity Lab. If you're from Guyana and you're interested in using applications of the UN Biodiversity Lab in your conservation work, please contact Annie and we can connect you with the other users in the country.
Amber, I think question 20 might be for you and then I can jump in on question 21. Great, thank you. Um, question 20 asks, what opportunities does remote sensing offer and what limits does it have in determining ecosystem quality and characteristics beyond those of high biodiversity value? Um, that's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, we touched on this a little bit early on, but it's always important to think about the uh, benefits and limitations of remote sensing data, especially NASA remote sensing data. Um, we don't want to claim that it can do everything for you. Um, so I think some of the opportunities um, are the ability to monitor um, large regions consistently over time. Um, and the limitations, particularly with NASA data, um, relate to the spatial resolution. In a lot of regions, uh, a 30 meter pixel um, with one data value within that 30 meter pixel may not be useful for your area if you're studying small regions. Um, and a lot of the um, NASA satellites, um, in particular when we think about ecosystem um, identification and management, they're optical sensors. Um, so we're, I, we're visualizing um, the re reflectivity of different uh, land surfaces. And so we may not be getting at these really um, detailed measurements of, of, of biodiversity. It sort of uses a proxy, right, to identify habitat um, health and um, extent, things like that. So, so there's a lot of factors to consider. Um, I also think one um, opportunity and benefit um, that I that I think we'll touch on here and, and we've touched on in other trainings is comparing remote sensing data to your ground observations and and having um, a network of both is really important um, to see the things that satellites can't see on the ground and and to have um, this full suite of, of information available. Um, I do want to mention that there are commercial satellites um, as well as drone data that may provide uh, that spatially relevant information at a higher resolution, but those oftentimes come at a cost. And again, it's just a matter of really thinking about your region and the opportunities and limitations um, that come about when um, you're focused on your area and your specific questions that you want answered. Um, so I think then um, back to you all for question 21. Yep, sounds great. Um, so all three of these questions, the next three questions are various aspects around our NASA Life on Land project. So I'm gonna try to combine them into one answer. Um, so the first question asks, could the UN Biodiversity Lab predict the changes in biodiversity according to climate change? Um, so currently the data that we have on the site doesn't do this. There are a few data layers that look at uh, changes in soil organic carbon under different management scenarios. But what I really wanna highlight here is that our NASA Life on Land project works to do this, looking particularly at the countries of Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. So that project is looking at various scenarios uh, for climate change from the IP, IPCC scenarios, scenarios in land use change using human footprint as a proxy for land use change, and changes in water risk. Um, so that project is basically using those drivers to assess how that will change impact on ecosystem structure uh, and key vertebrate populations. Um, we can we can definitely provide more information on the Life on Land project. However, for now, it's focused on these three countries: Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. If you're 
in one of those countries and are interested in learning more and connecting with the team we have working on the project in those countries, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're always trying to find um, more government ministries who are working on these topics in those countries or academic research institutions that could contribute data or help us to ground truth data that's coming out of the project. Um, there is another question that asks about the relationship between uh, climate change, human pressure, and land use. So I covered that a little bit, but basically in this project, we're looking at those um, drivers differently. So we're looking at how climate change would impact and then separately looking at how land use change will impact. And we'll, we're using human footprint as a proxy for land use change in the project. So for those of you who aren't familiar with human footprint, this comes from Oscar Venter and James Watson at the University of Northern British Columbia and the University of Queensland and the Wildlife Conservation Society. So the human, human footprint uses a variety of remote sense metrics to look at human pressure in various areas. So it sh can show the impact of increased human pressure uh, compared to various natural areas. So in this project, we're using that as a proxy for land use change that we can easily use um, in forecasting models. So happy to answer more questions about this project or to connect with anyone in those three countries who is particularly interested in input data or output data for those projects. But for now, it's, it's only looking at those three countries. So I hope that provided an answer for those questions. Great. Um, yeah, Chrissy, do you have anything else to add there? No, I think that was great. And I, the next question may help build on that. So question 24 says, I'm working in the field of sustainable development and empowerment and often develop initiatives to raise awareness. I do believe that showing images helps people to understand the reality of the climate crisis. We agree with you and commend your work. Um, how could the UN Biodiversity Lab share images showing the negative trends happening in the field related to all 17 of the SDGs? So I'll use an example of what we've done in the past. So we frequently use the global data, data available in the UN Biodiversity Lab to address big picture questions like this across the globe. As an example, we provided assessments to the 140 countries we support of their national progress to achieve the IT biodiversity targets, which are the CBD targets, at a national scale for key targets related to protected areas, habitat loss, habitat degradation, ecosystem services protection, etc. However, when we serve out these maps at, that are created using global data to nations around the world like this, we really consider these assessments draft because it's then up to each country to take a look at the maps and verify their accuracy in the context of their own country. We then work with countries to augment the global data sets with their own national data to ensure the analyses are accurate. So we could do this for other questions, perhaps not all of the SDGs, but for many of them, but for the the data, the, the pictures that we're sharing, the message that we're creating to really be accurate, it's best to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the country so that they can make the map their own and embrace it and then use it to communicate effectively. Great. So it looks like we have time for maybe one more question. So I'll go ahead and take take question 25 and Chrissy have you jump in with any further comments. Um, so how do you monitor policymaker use of UN Biodiversity Lab? How do you measure impact? Do you have examples of policymakers using the spatial data that feed directly into policy reform? And finally, what is your strategy for getting more policymakers from more countries to use the platform? So there's a lot of aspects of this question. I'll try to touch on them briefly as I know we need to wrap up. Um, so one of the easiest ways we use to monitor policymaker use of, uh, of UN Biodiversity Lab is through the number 
of users we have registered in the private projects. So these are all specifically policymakers who are working on the creation of the six national report in these countries. So we have over 200 policymakers from about 60 different countries who are using UN Biodiversity Lab currently. And we're working particularly not only to expand the number of countries who are active on the site, but also to work deeper in these individual countries to see how we can bring in policymakers who are working on related issues in different ministries and different divisions of the same ministry and to really foster connections among stakeholders working in the same country. We have a couple different ways we measure impact. Um, we have some quantitative numbers in terms of the numbers of policymakers who are active on the site, the number of national level data that's been uploaded to the site, the increase in the use of spatial data between the fifth national report and the sixth national report. But we also try to really balance this information with individual stories from the countries we, look, we work with, really understanding how they've used the data and what the impacts have been for them in country. So you'll hear from two of our countries in webinar three on April 7th, Costa Rica and Colombia on this. And we also have a number of different um, story maps and communication products that show how, how countries have been using UN Biodiversity Lab over the past couple of years. Chrissy, do you have anything else that you wanna add in? to that question that as we wrap up. That was an excellent response, thank you. Great, all right, well back over to you, Amber. I think it's probably about time to wrap up, but I will defer to you. Great, thank you, Annie and Christina, so much for being on and, and taking the time to answer these questions. Um, we have a lot of them and it's engaging and great to hear from you all. Um, what we will do is we will try to um, answer some of these other questions and um, fix the um, written in answers to the questions that we've already answered. Um, and then eventually uh, we will post this to our website. Um, so just stay tuned for that. And I just wanna thank everyone again for being on with us today. It's great to see so many folks from around the world and thank you for sharing your names and your countries and your affiliations. Um, and do join us next week at the same time. Um, and we will, during that session, really dive into the UN Biodiversity Lab, get some examples, um, see a demonstration of what could be done. And um, so we're really excited uh, for next week's session as well. So we will end here at that. And um, again, thank you all for being with us.